On April the 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Nine days later, Joseph E. Johnson, whose troops were defending the Carolinas against the devastating raid by William T. Sherman, surrendered as well. For the South, the war was over, and the process of determining what the region would look like now began. The end of the Civil War was in many ways the foundation for a new South. But before we can talk about a new South, we have to look at what was being left behind with the old. The first and greatest effect of the war was definitely emancipation. As you know, the Old South was dependent on and in many ways defined by the institution of slavery. The first slaves brought to North America landed in the Chesapeake in 1620. For the next 250 years, slavery expanded and adapted to the southern economy. By the 1820s and 30s, slavery had become the iconic image of the South. Now, slavery was a changing and adapting institution. Some slaves lived in southern cities, enjoying relative personal liberty, sometimes even earning wages. Some slaves lived on small farms, working closely with white masters to bring in crops. Other slaves lived on large plantations as part of labor forces of hundreds. Despite the differences, slavery everywhere was cruel. Life lived at the whim of an owner. Families were split up and sold off. Slaves were beaten for real and perceived offenses. Slave women were taken advantage of and slaves didn't have the right to care for themselves. Slavery was central to the way white Southerners saw themselves and organized themselves as well. For the minority of Southerners who did own slaves, slavery was central to their economic well-being. Cotton and other cash crops made agriculture the driving force in the Southern economy and played an integral part in the rise of the elite plantation owners. Without slavery, the South would not have developed as it did because cotton and other cash crops were labor-intensive and tight profit margins required cheap slave labor, not paid white wage labor. But slavery was not just about money. Slavery was central to the Southern political system. For the most part, Southern politics was ruled by elites. Slave plantations were a source of real wealth and real profit from cash crops. Large slave owners were the wealthiest people in the South, and they held the highest positions in state governments. And elites were able to use slavery as a political tool to tie whites together. They were able to use slavery, particularly the fear of emancipation, to maintain control of poor and middling whites. The elites convinced poor and non-slaveholding whites that the institution of slavery ensured that they too had privilege, even if they were excluded from the prosperity and power that it brought, even if a person was destitute. If he or she was white, he or she had a kind of value Southern blacks did not. Plus, considering slaves were expensive and slave ownership was a symbol of one's wealth, owning a slave was an ideal that all whites wanted to protect. So non-slaveholding whites actively worked to preserve slavery. They even served as overseers on plantations and willingly joined slave patrols to help maintain order and round up runaways. Well, as the war progressed, emancipation became an important act of war for the Union. Encouraging freedom for slaves was not just an act to remove labor sources from the South. It was also a way to demoralize Southerners. Slaves played a central role in emancipation as well. The closer that Union troops came to a plantation, the more successful slaves were at leaving. Slaves who couldn't flee slowed the work and found ways to actively undermine the plantation economy. Of the slaves who made it to the Union lines, some fought. Others, who made up the majority, took on roles as laborers. But in both cases, they took an active part in the Union war effort. When the conflict ended, Southerners prepared to accept and resist emancipation. One of the central conflicts of the post-war years was the fight over status of freed men and women. Southern whites, 
Northerners in the South, and African Americans all had different visions of freedom, and all would work to make their vision a reality. In addition to helping to bring slavery to an end, the Civil War highlighted internal divisions that marked Southern life. Southern leaders liked to talk about regional solidarity, but the Confederate war effort intensified differences between rich and poor, and differences between those living in various regions. One of the biggest conflicts came between wealthy planters and yeoman farmers, who were small-scale sufficiency farmers who struggled to make a living. As I mentioned earlier, one reason that slavery was so important to Southern leaders was that it served to mask economic and social differences. As long as blacks were unfree, all whites had a common freedom. But the yeoman South was very different than the plantations. Most yeomen were centered in areas called the upcountry. Upcountry land was not as fertile as areas dominated by the large landowners. Plantations dominated in areas of relatively flat land that had rich soils created by millions of years of decaying forests and deposits of nutrients left behind by receding oceans. Most farmers in the upcountry, however, barely got by. They were far from wealthy. They depended on their communities to survive through barter, sharing, and cooperation. It was therefore a very different life from the wealthy isolation of the plantations. South Carolina is a very good example. Numerous plantations dotted the state in the coastal zone where rice was the cash crop grown on the sea islands and the coastal plain which reached north to the middle of the state near Columbia. Above the Sand Hills region, which was at one time the shoreline of the Atlantic, lies the Piedmont and includes Abbeville and present-day Greenwood. There were plantations in this area, but fewer existed as you moved north towards Greenville and the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Up to the Civil War, yeomen and planters hadn't always seen eye to eye, but they generally cooperated by respecting local authority. Planters allowed for a kind of home rule, but the secession crisis ended that truce. As Southerners sent representatives to state capitals to talk about disunion, it was clear that in some upcountry areas, people were not as supportive of breaking away. Granted, most Southerners, rich and poor, supported the war effort, but many upcountry areas were more hesitant. The best example is probably East Tennessee, the area around Knoxville, the Smoky Mountains. This was an area that was typical of upcountry small farmers from around the South as the rest of Tennessee, dominated by the slaveholding plantations of central Tennessee, called for secession, people in the east rejected the idea. Many enlisted in the Union Army, participated in acts of localized terrorism, burned bridges, persecuted the minority who supported the Confederacy, and their political representatives even called for secession from the south. Making matters worse between planter and yeoman was the way the war was fought. As in the North, the Confederacy enacted a draft, but there were concerns because a flood of white men into the army threatened to take away oversight on slave plantations. So the Confederate government enacted what was called the Twenty Negro Law. This law exempted anyone with over 20 slaves. As a result, many poor farmers talked about a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Even when yeomen didn't actively resist, they did express discontent. Poor white farmers were more likely to protest policies of the Confederate government, particularly what they saw as unfair tax rates. See, the government did not tax land, meaning that the central source of wealth of the rich was completely untaxed. Yeomen were more likely to desert as well. Of the 100,000 soldiers who went AWOL, Almost all came from the poorest classes of non-slaveholders whose labor was indispensable to the daily support of their families. By the end of the war, it was also clear that the upcountry areas were bearing the true cost of the war. The upcountry supplied most of the men who fought in the war and bore disproportional amounts of deaths because they were too poor, of course, to avoid the draft. 
The war also placed undue stress on upcountry economies due to taxes, losses of manpower, and devastation of the war. These were important consequences for the post-war world. The upcountry was no longer safely in the court of the southern plantation white leaders. In fact, the upcountry would become a source of political resistance. Another important consequence of the war was the changing relationship between men and women. Slavery worked to reinforce traditional gender roles. The plantation owner was usually a male, and Southern society and culture emphasized masculine aspects of the master, who was considered business-oriented and was certainly the head of the family. Regardless, if a family owned slaves or not, women and children were dependents. Like slaves, their lives were determined by the whim of the father or the husband. Well, the war created difficulties. When fighting broke out, masters left and women on plantations took over the daily operations, including the overseeing of slaves who were less willing to work. In the upcountry, women had always been essential to the survival of their families. But with husbands gone, women struggled to continue making a living on the soil. Changing gender relations were also important for African American families. Even in the depths of bondage, slave families tried to create normal lives. This was very difficult. As you are aware, there were no guarantees of family security. At any point, a master could sell entire families or individual members. Slave marriage was outlawed. Owners did not want slaves to create any kind of bonds that would cause resistance when families were broken up. Owners also wanted to draw a line between gendered morality of white families and those of slave families. With emancipation, as we'll see, one of the first things slave families did was to legalize relationships. It was a way to draw boundaries and enjoy fruits of freedom. Finally, we need to discuss the sheer destruction the South would have to deal with in the years after the war. One of the most fertile and productive areas of the entire region was the Shenandoah Valley. But it saw a number of sweeping raids. By 1865, barns and homes had been burned, bridges were demolished, tools were broken or stolen, livestock was eaten, and one observer said it was almost a desert. Sherman's raid did similar damage through Georgia and the Carolinas, burning structures and fields wherever his men marched. Economically, the South lost millions. South Carolina's war debt alone was $24 million, and the loss of black laborers due to emancipation was estimated to be $5.4 billion. Thus, nearly half of the state's 1860 wealth had disappeared, and the war brought unbelievable death to the South. 37,000 Southern blacks died fighting for the Union Army, and tens of thousands more died in contraband camps, in labor gangs, and in ruined towns and villages. 260,000 white men died for the Confederacy. This was over one-fifth of the adult population. It's estimated that as much as 31 to 35 percent of South Carolina's adult population died in the war. Many others who came home were maimed and disabled, and thus would be unlikely to be productive farmers again. So we can see that the war destroyed everything it touched, and set the stage for Reconstruction which would dominate the next decade. On the surface, Reconstruction was about a victorious North attempting to solidify its gains while preparing the South to return to the Union. But we need to think larger. Reconstruction, as we'll see, was about Southerners coming to terms with all the conflicts that the war had highlighted. What will be the relationship between whites and blacks? What will be the relationship between rich and poor? between plantation and upcountry? What about the relationship between men and women? What did the war and its aftermath mean for the region as a whole? Well, in the next few days, we're going to spend most of our time trying to understand how Reconstruction helped to create a foundation for the New South.